Everything was predominated, every area of life, by the church. There was only one church, the Catholic Church. Well, the, what makes the Reformation so critically important is that with the Renaissance, you had the, and this is a word I want you to remember about this, the Renaissance, the Reformation was primarily a process of secularization. Okay. You need to be able to handle these kind of phrases. I know anything more than three syllables has got to be Chinese. What it is is here's the age of faith, the Middle Ages, where every religion dominated everything from cradle to the grave. What well, with the Renaissance, you had the secularization of economics, politics, art. But with the Reformation, you had the breakup of the Roman Catholic Church. Now there is not one holy Catholic. There is, in a sense, but there are different choices. There's the Protestant Church, there's the Radical Reformation, there's, of course, the Catholic Church with all its problems. And so the breakup of the medieval synthesis, the final nail in the coffin, was the Protestant Reformation where successfully heretics, people that kick against the, swim against the stream, break up and, and the world now has a choice. Am I Protestant or am I saying? And they'll fight for a hundred years, kill each other, torture each other, burn each other at the stake to finally say, enough! Whatever the king's religion, that's your religion. If you don't like it, move to a place where the king coincides with your faith, with your religion. So with the secularization of economics, for instance, was the rise of capitalism. The separation of politics is the rise of nations. Now all of a sudden there isn't just one Holy Roman Emperor. You've got France and England and Spain and the likes. The secularization of art, you had realism as opposed to medieval symbolism. Architecture, yeah, literature, instead of writing religious stories now, they write you things like Canterbury Tales. How many read Canterbury Tales? How religious is that? It, it's, it, it is just down to earth. Of course, the teachers say, whatever you do, don't read the Miller's Tale. Do you remember that? Of course, everybody runs out and reads the Miller's Tale. But it is it's ribald. It is raucous. Well, that's the secularization of literature. The separation of philosophy is... Theology is no longer the queen of the science. And you have the rise of science itself. Uh, uh, all of it is secularization, but with the Protestant Reformation, the church now comes under criticism or dis dissonance. So for that reason, it is critically important. The Reformation was the breakup of the church, and the church is the most dominant institution of life in the Western world. The church was the only <coughs> institution that date back to the classical world of the Greeks and Romans, the art and philosophy. We lost the writings of Plato and many of the great Greek uh, playwrights. They ended up just being destroyed by the barbarians or, or lost in the dusty back shelves of some monastery. But, but as I say, with the, uh, the church itself, it was the only thing that dated back to the glories of the classical world. Now it's being broken apart. Let me talk just a little bit. It's still back on the relationship between the Reformation and the Renaissance. They both happen about the same time, and there are some people that would say the Reformation is just the religious expression of the Renaissance and secularization, and that to me is true. Let me talk first about similarities, and I'll talk about some of the differences between the two, okay? This will be number one, number two. Whatever. Some of the similar, both the Renaissance and the Reformation were movements towards individualism. Individualism is where the individual is important, even more important than society as a whole. I've got to be me. I've got to march to the drum of my own drum, beat of my own drum. The Renaissance, for instance, and this is still this idea of individualism, the Renaissance held the artist as hero. Guys like Leonardo, and you have to wait till next semester to go into that. He's just one of the most brilliant geniuses ever. People like uh, uh, Da Vinci and, and, and Michelangelo and Raphael coming up with new art forms and geniuses. And these are the heroes. And as heroes, that's the individuals, not the society as a whole. Same thing with the Reformation. The one overwhelming, most critical doctrine of the Reformation, there are many important, but this one, don't forget, of the Reformation is the priesthood of the believer. <clears throat> what 
What do we mean when we say priesthood of believer? What is that idea? What does it entail? Okay, every individual is a priest in some right. First Peter 2 9. For you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. You don't have to go to another priest to get forgiveness of sin. You don't have to go to a priest, though you might want to consult with him, to find out what God's will for your life is or what this passage of scripture means. The priests are ever believers. The medieval church and the Catholic Church, there that's anathema to them. Common believers don't know enough to understand the Word of God. Number one, the Word of God was only in the Latin, and 90% of the priests couldn't even read Latin. So if you're going to understand it, you don't even know what it means. You've got to go to somebody who's ordained. Do you know how that carries on still? How? Well, right now in the Middle East, Muslims, most of them can't read the Quran. No, 90%. Yeah. I've got to talk about it since you brought it up. <laughs> About 15 years ago, the Saudi Arabian government, untold billions on their hands, decided they would put the Koran in the language of the vernacular all over the Muslim world. And in doing so, they're one of the greatest impetuses for the evangelization of Muslims. Because they got young people from Iran and, and, and Indonesia all of a sudden reading the Koran and says, is that all there is? Man, that's, that's not much. I could see all kinds of country, you know. And, and so, but but in, in Islam, you have to go to the, the the imam. In Catholicism, you can't get married outside the church. In Catholicism, it's whatever the church says that's law. Especially if the pope speaks ex cathedra from the cathedral. In Catholicism, you've got to go to the priest to get forgiveness of sin. Does that idea linger at all in Baptist or, or Protestant churches? No. How many have ever seen a woman baptize her daughter? Why not? It's the individual decision. Pardon me? It's the individual decision. It is. Well, how come more people, I think of godly mothers and the influence they have leading their children to faith in Christ. I've had fathers who are not ordained but because they were so influential, the privilege of baptizing their own children. And I get pushed back on that. Well, they're not ordained. Oh, excuse me, the Great Commission says go into all the world and preach the gospel, baptize them if you're ordained. Well, that's a carryover from this idea of Catholicism that only the clergy are worthy. Or, well, I could, I could go on. Anyhow, the priests are believers. Boy, when you're, if you're writing on the essay on, on the Reformation, make sure you include that. Stop me looking for that somewhere to how critical that is. Let's say, both the Renaissance and Reformation, <coughs> excuse me, are individualistic. Both are partially due, the Renaissance, Reformation and the Renaissance, are partially due to the rise of capitalism as an economic system right around this year, 1500. And I'll explain that. And even today I'll explain that a little later on in the lecture. But just write it down and try to remember it. And the new middle class. In the Middle Ages, you didn't have a middle class. When I talk about middle class, how do you describe the middle classes of society? You know, the rich are the aristocracy, the kings and queens and lords and nobles, the Downton Abbey types. The poor are the poor. The middle class, how do you describe middle class? Okay, the majority of the population in many cases, although you have many societies where the middle class is a minority, and those are societies that don't, that are usually backward. What do they do for a living, middle classes? Merchant class. Pardon me? Merchant okay, merchants. See, before, before capitalism, you didn't have merchants. Artisans, servants, they're not slaves. They get paid a wage. But as the new middle class began to grow with the rise of Catholicism, you have all of a sudden, it, is it just a coincidence that, that capitalism took hold in Northern Europe before it did Southern India, Europe and that the Reformation was far more successful in Northern Europe than in Southern Europe? The middle class needed a church, a theology that supported what they felt was important, their values. I'll explain that later on today. Both uh, the Reformation and the Renaissance, here's a good word, were reactionary. I'm getting about three weeks ahead of myself, but let me explain this. Let's say this compendium. This is the left and this is the right. Political, social ideas. 
What do you call someone who is generally opposed to change, politically, socially, economically? What would be a term for that? Conservative. Conservative. Okay, left wing. What would you call someone who is generally <coughs> for change? Liberal. Liberal. Okay. okay. Now, someone who is not only so against change, but they want to go back in time, that's what we call a reactionary. So conservative. They think we've gone too far already. Let's get back to our founding fathers. Let's make America go. I didn't say that. Uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, but reactionary, we want to go back in time. So scared about a future and all the changes coming, let's go back to the good old days. Liberals want to make changes, but what do you call extreme liberals? Well, libertarian is close, that'd be about here. Revolutionary. They want so much change, there's nothing worth this society in, in, in changing us and burn it to the ground and build something wholly new and different. So I'll be using these kind of phrases all semester long. Any, do you have any question about what these mean? Reactionary is so conservative they want to go back in time. Conservative is opposed to change. Liberal is open to change. Revolutionary wants to burn it all down. <laughs> Revolt. Extreme right wing, extreme left wing. Is that a question? Just stretching. Okay, I'll allow you to stretch. Tell me your name again. Becker. Becker. Okay. Okay. Well, as I say, both the Renaissance and the Reformation were reactionary. The Renaissance, uh, uh, what were they wanting to return to? The, the classical world, the Greco Roman period, good man. They wanted to go back and recover the glory that was ancient Greece and ancient Rome. And the Renaissance really began when people began learning Greek as a language and Latin and finding these great literary works in the back shelves of monasteries and translating them. And all of a sudden, what these, all they had left was the stones of monuments of classical architecture that was so much better. And now they want to learn more about it. So they want to go back to the classical world. The Protestant Reformation was reactionary, and what they weren't trying to change the church into something new and better, at least they were claiming not to. They wanted to go back to the New Testament church. They wanted to recover the original theology and practice <coughs> of the church of the Bible, the New Testament. Well, so there's similarity, but there are also differences between the Reformation and the Renaissance. The Renaissance was humanistic. Have you heard that word around here much? What does it mean? It means that instead of having a focus on God, it has a focus on man. Okay, ultimate focus on man. That it is secular. That man is basically good and not basically evil. Humanism, it, it's that man is the measure of all things. I don't need a God. I don't need a sacred book to tell me what's right and wrong. I can, make that, I can find it myself. Well, the Renaissance was humanistic, but the Reformation is deeply religious. One of the principles along the priesthood of the believer of, of, the Renaissance, of the Reformation is sola, this is Latin, scriptura. What is our authority? Sola means only, only the scriptures. And the scriptures are final authority for the reformers. The Renaissance was basically tolerant. Everybody did what they thought was right in their own eyes. The Reformation was essentially intolerant. If you don't agree with me, I clap you in jail, torture you, put you on a rack, or burn you at the stake. Both sides, terrible, terrible atrocities. Scores of millions of people tortured to death because their religious beliefs didn't fall in with the prevailing government. The Renaissance, there were different Renaissance emphasized man's goodness in that they were humanistic. The Reformation insisted in human depravity. God, we need to talk about these. We will before the semester is out. Do you think man is basically good at heart? No, no. no. Mm -hmm. Haven't you ever looked at a crib of a newborn? And aren't they sweet and innocent? Don't, don't tell me a, a, a newborn baby is born evil. You're telling me that? We'll get into it. Hang on. <laughs> Hold that thought, okay. Well, various interpretations of the Reformation. Different ways, different factors, and I'll talk about several political factors, religious factors, and economic today. There's a cultural interpretation of the Re Reformation. 
That's the insistence that the Reformation was only the religious expression of the Renaissance. It was part of secularization. And that, that there's truth to that. There's truth. That the Reformation was just a religious expression of the general secularization of the Renaissance itself. Well, and there's truth to that. An economic interpretation. That the basic motivation behind the rise of the Protestant church was economic. <coughs> that the Reformation was the result of the rise of capitalism. You have a whole new middle class that's growing and burgeoning that you didn't have back in the age of faith in the Middle Ages. A new middle class. Trade was now being carried out to the Orient. Explorers were finding a whole new world and coming back with boatloads of silver and gold and spices from the Orient. Can you imagine the first time the lady of the manor tasted cinnamon? Oh, man, talk about an explosion of sensation. i got to have more of that. Can you imagine the first time the lady of the manor puts on a silk gown as opposed to homespun? Now there's a demand for those products. And if you're willing to take the risk, you can come back and humongous profits. <coughs> well, the church says you can only make so much profit. That it's a sin to be too rich, unless you're a churchman, of course. Well, you got you got the rise of capitalism now. Bankers making money hand over fist, as well as merchants and, and, and all this kind of thing. What are you going to do with it? Well, you needed a religion that says it's okay to make a whole lot of profit so long as you do what's right with it. Uh, uh, like I say, economic drought. I'll talk more about this. The taxation that the church from Rome and Italy was putting on the people was just getting to be a pain in the neck for these middle class people. In capitalism, what does the word capital mean? Money. Money. Who's money? It's moneyism. That's what that economic system purely is all about. Well, in, as I say, the papal taxes are flowing into the Vatican, and the Vatican are wasting it on unbelievable profligacy, wickedness. I'd be embarrassed to go into the details in a mixed crowd like this, and I won't. There's a political interpretation of the Reformation. I'm just going to touch on these and I'll develop them more. That the Reformation was the result of the rise of nations or nationalism. Up until the Renaissance the Reformation, you didn't have any nation states. You had the ideal of there being a whole Roman Empire, but Europe, the West, was broken up into tiny little fiefdoms and duchies and dukedoms and, and, and kingdoms, but not what we would know as nation states that united significant numbers of people under one ruler. That the monarchs, people like Henry VIII, they were absolute rulers. And when the Pope says you can't do that, he said, who says? <coughs> and the Pope says, I says. And he says, nuts to you. And he has a law passed in Parliament called the Act of Supremacy that says the Pope is no longer the supreme head of the Church of England. The King of England is. Bang, you got to break away a whole nation that is now, by definition, Protestant. Though Henry VIII was still very Catholic in his theology and his understanding, again, it's the breakaway of the church from Rome, the secularization of religion, but for political reasons, personal reasons. He needed a son. His very Catholic wife, Catherine, had miscarried three or four times, and now his girlfriend, Anne Boleyn, is five months pregnant. And he needed a, a divorce from Catherine so he could marry his mistress, who he was sure was going to give him a son. We'll get into that Tuesday, okay. Well, there are psychological factors. Any of you psych majors or minors? None of you. Oh, then you're just scratching? Okay, okay. Is it Becca? No. Yes, Mary. Uh -huh. Bear with me. I'm, I'll get it. Yeah, you're Becca. That's yeah. right. Okay. Um, This would be, if you're interested in psychology at all, there's a good biography of Luther by the authors Eric Erickson, a Freudian psychologist. I think it's titled Young Man Luther. And Luther, oh, I do okay. Luther, all his life, was desperate to please his father. In all of his writings, he only mentions his mother once. But his father, was a new middle class, he'd been a miner of the lower classes, and somehow the hard work, he'd managed enough money to buy a share in the mines. 
And so he's now the new, and he won <coughs> his son to go into a middle class occupation, nothing more middle class than becoming a lawyer. So he sends him off to law school. Luther comes home to go to the death of one of his best friends, and all of a sudden he's been shocked by mortality. Luther's young man was the life of the party, always jokester, always the one dancing on the table and everybody's drunk underneath it, this kind of thing, happy-go-lucky. Now all of a sudden he's shocked in seriousness. On his way back to law school, he gets caught in a lightning storm, the lightning bolt hits right next, the horse rears up, casts him, throws him off, lands on his head, knocks him out. When he comes to, he says, I'll become a monk. And now he sets out to try to please his heavenly father. Well, that's the way you do it, you become a monk. But his earthly father is P.O. He is ticked. What <coughs> kind of waste of time is that? You know, what, you, all, all this kind of, and, and, and so he's trying desperately to please his heavenly father, his earthly father. And, and when he's you know, on his ordination, he's up in the choir, I'll sing in the choir until it comes time to lay hands on him. His father finally comes to that, and he's so stressed out, he passes out in the choir line. Well, and so he's trying <coughs> at all costs to get Luther in his own writing, he says he's trying to please God. And I'll go into more detail probably on Tuesday, if not next Thursday on this. And, and finally he's preparing to, to keep from a nervous breakdown. He's teaching, he's got his PhD now, and he's teaching uh, on the book of Romans, and he gets to Romans 117. The just shall live by faith. But you can't earn God's approval by keeping all the sacraments and making all the pilgrimages. You just have to believe it. And he says, like the dawn bursts forth, and that is the basis and other basis. Faith alone, scripture. Well, Erickson makes the point that when he made this discovery, Luther all his life had trouble with constipation. Just saying. <laughs> all his life. And it says he was in his own closet. <coughs> well, that word closet can mean what the Brits call a water closet. You know what a water closet is? It's a toilet. At last, and this psychological thing, it burst upon him. Well, whatever. But there's a psychological interpretation of the Reformation as a possibility to explain. And then there's the religious interpretation that the corruption in the Roman Catholic Church was so deep and so unchangeable, unwilling to change. Oh, there's a book I just read this summer, I'm trying to think of it, In Search of Folly. But anyway, of the unbelievable corruption of the four Renaissance, uh, Reformation popes. And just totally, they make the Roman emperors like Nero look like Sunday school kids. Just wait. And they refused to change, and thus a new reformed church came about. Well, these are some of the possible interpretations. Keep these in mind as I go now to try to go into detail, especially next Tuesday when I tell you what happens and when. All that's kind of background. Let me talk about the economic factors behind the Reformation. Yes? Before we move on, were the interpretations like um, the reasons why the Reformation? Yes, that's a, you know, there's a cultural explanation of why it happened, an economic really great reason why it happened. Those are good questions, honey. And anytime you, you have a question like that, just let me know. I hope you understand. I want every one of you to do well this semester. My hope and prayer is that all of you get an A. And you earn it, I promise you, you'll get it. Hasn't happened yet, but I, I, I am not out to give a hard time to anybody. I want you to know this stuff. This is important. And then to know the significance. Let me talk now about the economic factors behind the Reformation. The church held between 25 and 35 percent of all the real estate of Europe. Wealthy matrons would die and wanting to shorten their stay in purgatory, they'd will their lands to the papacy or to some monastery. So between 25 and 30 percent of Europe's real estate. And like today, if the church owned it, the state couldn't tax it. So you got roughly a third of all the real estate and housings and castles of Europe that are not subject to taxation. Well, the government's going to get its taxes one way or the other. That still hasn't changed. The middle class. There's another word for middle class. Anyone know what that might be? It's a French word? 
bourgeoisie. Bourgeoisie. Bourgeois, without the Z, is an adjective of effort. The new bourgeoisie, the middle class, they were resenting all these properties that the church held. That did, because who ends up paying the taxes when the rich get off because uh, uh, whatever insights they got? And the poor don't have anything to give. It's the middle class with the taxation. That hasn't changed. Well, they were resentful of the church's real estate. They were forced to bear the load. And there are kings and nobles as well as the middle class looking for a chance to grasp the church property. When Henry VIII in 1524 had Parliament pass the Act of Supremacy, immediately all the church holdings of England, 30%, now belong to Henry. And by the way, he was hurting because he'd been involved in so many wars up until then, the treasury is empty. Immediately becomes a multi, multi, multi millionaire. And he gives them away to his close friends, just in passing. One of the men that did his bidding gave the task of giving the deeds of these various monasteries and grounds to political friends who needed their support. Well, one of the guys who was his emissary's messenger was a dude by the name of Jack Horner. Actually, John Horner, but Jack is the abbreviation form of, of John. And so he has about 12 deeds in a bag, and he's set off to give them to the various <coughs> lords of the manor that the king needs their support. Well, what he did, he looked in the bag, and he pulled out the richest of all the deeds, stuck it in his back pocket. Little Jack Horner sat in a corner, eating his curds and waist, stuck in his thumb, pulled out plum. What's the plum? the richest deed, and said, what a good boy am I. His family still owns that property. That's for free. I won't be asked around the test, okay? Anyway, anyway, uh, economic for the church holdings, instead of middle class resented. They resented papal taxes. P-A-P-A-L is the way you spell papal. That means it comes from the Pope, from the Vatican. To begin with, you had the tithe. What does tithe mean? Come on, class. Tithe is, tithe is what? Like a certain percentage. What percentage? 10%. 10%. Gotta have that down or I'm gonna, you can't be a Christian if you don't know that. Okay, but it's, it's 10%. Well, it's, you didn't have any say. That was automatically taken up. Middle class, lower class, whatever. You had the tithe. It was expected. It was even enforced from, uh, uh, from every corner. You had what was known as Peter's Pence. Every year, the church would take a penny from each household. Say, what's a penny? Back then, a penny was a lot more, and it just graded on it. Every household had to pay on January 1st a penny to the local bishop. From every family in Christendom. He had other fees. If you wanted, I'll get more to this, indulgence. You'd have to pay for them. Indulgence means kind of, well, I know you've been cheating on your wife, and of course God knows it, the whole town knows it, but if you pay me 150 bucks, I'll take 150 years off your stay in purgatory. Grace for sale. Well, after a while, you see all that money flowing to the church. That's just one, indulgences. Uh, um, dispensations. A dispensation it's kind of like a written excuse, a hall pass from the church. If your wife has gotten fat and ugly and you've got your mind set on a prettier, younger model, you go to the church and say, hey, I need a new wife. They give you a dispensation. I know you vowed for better or for worse till death is depart, but we'll give, you a, we'll give you an excuse. We'll give you a hall pass. Kick her out of her ear. She's divorced. So you're free. Well, but you do it. It costs money every time you turn around. Uh, uh, if there's a judicial system where your neighbor got the back 40 acres, a local judge, you could go to the church and they would reverse the decision, but it cost money. Uh, it just went on and on. It was a major drain of money from Northern Europe, especially, to Italy, farther and farther away. 
And you hear these rumors of these fat, profligate Italian popes spending it on 40 different mis uh, mistresses and wild parties that they're too embarrassed to even talk about. And another shrine or cathedral or whatever else, uh, Michelangelo didn't paint the Sistine Chapel for free. And all these things cost, and the people in the north of Europe, especially, they're not getting any bang for their buck. As well as these kind of resentments, capitalism as an economic system. Let me get into detail here a little bit. <coughs> in the Middle Ages, you remember the church dominated the economy. The church said that society, and this is a, a critical issue you're going to have to decide for yourself on, is society just a collection of individuals? Or is society an organic whole where we're all related to one another? Well, if one part hurts, the other the rest of the body hurts. Do you think society is or should be that? Was John Donne right and said, Ask not for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. No man is an island in the tire of itself. But all of us are part of the same cloud. And when one part hurts, we all hurt. Well, that was the medieval view of society. That all of society is an organic whole. <coughs> and therefore, Ben can't get rich at Becca's expense. So Becca goes without food while Ben is eating pizzas all night long and, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> you know, that's wrong. Well, Ben made his money by charge. Remember we talked about the Big Pen business, you know, maybe four or five cents to produce, but the Big Pen people charge a dollar ninety-eight for it. Well, if they can get a dollar ninety-eight, they ought to get a dollar ninety-eight. No, not in the Middle Ages. There's such a thing as a fair and just price. You shouldn't charge too much. Uh, and you shouldn't work poor people like Sarah to the bone at starvation wages. You have a fair and just wage for not Ben. He's going to get rich. He doesn't care who drops like flies along the way. Well, that, that's the attitude. To the medieval economy, anyone who gets rich at others' expense is no better than a common thief. Now you have the rise of capitalism for a number of reasons. Where the going theory is, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there. Have you heard that? Every man for himself. Adam Smith, who's the great philosopher behind Cap, if you're an economic major, you've got to read Adam Smith. That'd be a great book. It's a little thick. But basically, he describes society as being like a sand pile. <coughs> They're all just individual grains of sand with no relationship to each other. Everybody is striving to better himself. And he says, when we're free to do that, to better ourselves however we might, he says, he honestly used this phrase, an invisible hand will move society as a whole to better to prog progress and improvement. Baloney. When there are no restrictions, the rich get rich and the poor get kids. Poor. <laughs> Whatever, same thing. When there are no restrictions, there are just some who can't make it, and if you don't look out for them, they're going to get caught up in the process. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there, and I'm wearing milk bone shorts. Remember that? Uh, what was that? Cheers. That was Norm. Oh in, in, in capitalism, the, the only rule is all the traffic will bear. What, if I can get $5 for this pen, I'm an idiot to only charge $1.98. Capitalism is moneyism. It's all about money, and everybody is responsible to get as much money as they possibly can. And you charge whatever the traffic will bear. Some of you are thinking about book reports to read. Uh, the Jungle, Upton Sinclair. I think I put that in one of the possibilities describes the meatpacking companies in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s in Chicago. And how hard it is for the poor worker to make any progress. Because the government has said there'll be no rules, there'll be no unions, there'll be no strikes, and you charge the worker whatever you can get away with, and if you've got a labor supply is what they had, then you can charge them. And if you don't like it, there's 10 people waiting in line to take your place at the job. And if, you, if they're selling, like in the meat companies, they're, they're putting in the hot... Do you know what goes into hot dogs? Do you have any idea? Back then, the horse's hooves, his genitalia, his intestines, just grind it up. If a man walking on a catwalk, you don't have a rail. 
that's going to cost money. I got to make money. So without a ray, he trips and falls in the vat. You just chew him up, and he comes out as tomorrow's hot dog. And up there, Sinclair's in the jungle describes that kind. Of, well, it's it, so if you get a hot dog that's poisonous meat, was well, your fault for buying it. Let the buyer beware. If you buy a car that's got a, a, a gaps in the oil rings, piston rings, that's your problem. Let the buyer beware. You bought it, you're stuck with it. Well, that's the value of capitalism. Well, now you have these new capitalists, bankers, merchants, coming on the scene. And they need a religion which supported their economic practices. Here's another good, any of you business majors? Okay, you got them. Adam Smith is a big figure. This one not nearly so sick. Thick, sick. Max Weber. He's a German sociologist in 1870. He wrote a book called Protestant Ethic and the Rise of Capitalism. It's a classic. Every businessman, in fact, every student ought to read Weber. And Weber is a German sociologist. And he said, here's what happened with the Renaissance, the rise of capitalism. <coughs> you had middle class merchants, there all of a sudden there was such a clamor, such a demand for the goods that they could bring in from the Orient and the New World. Well, what do you do with all that money? They were Christians, so theoretically, unless you're in the Vatican, you can't go and spend it on another mistress. You can't go and waste it. The Protestant ethic says, says this. All of us are working for one boss primarily. Who's the one boss? God. Whatever you do and do a word or do, you do all to the glory of God. Well, that means you've got to be the best businessman, the best student, whatever else. That's the Bible. So by their hard work and their energy, they're making more money, but because they're Christians, they can't go spend it. So the only thing you do is you pour it back into the company. And you buy more ships. And they come back with more profits. So you can, you can only buy so many villas in Florence. And so you pour it back in the company, and these companies grew exponentially. Well, they needed a, a, a religion that, that said it's okay to make money. And, and, and Protestantism says that if you're a good Christian, God will prosper you. Basically, it's Reformed Calvinism. That righteous people prosper. I have never seen the righteous beg for bread. Have you heard that? Hard work will pay off. And generally speaking, that's true. But the Protestant ethic says you can't go spend it on yourself, so report back in the business. And that's what Protestantism basically said. It became the religion of the middle class. Capitalism was far more prevalent in Northern Europe, where the Protestant Reformation took over, than in Southern Europe. The elect will be blessed by God with prosperity. So capitalism was strongest in Britain, in Holland, in northern Germany, and in New England in America. Stop. Is capitalism essentially anti-Christian? What do you think? Caleb? Okay, I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there. Yes, I is it? They thought it wasn't. They thought it wasn't. Now, like I say, these Dutch merchants, they had a, a view of Christianity that allowed for this. Okay. It is something you're going to have to, you know, essentially America is to an extent a capitalist country. And this campus and this university has been built on the contributions of wealthy businessmen. Yes. I think capitalism is sort of like humans. They can, um, they can either be good, used for good, or be used for evil. Okay, okay. If it's gonna be used for good, if it's just left up to the goodness of men's heart, what does the Bible say about the goodness of men's heart? The heart is what? 
Deceitful. Yeah, Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately, who can understand it? So if you're just going to wait on the goodness of mankind, is there a responsibility for government to pass laws so that the wealthy don't oppress the poor? Of course, you got the wealthy businessmen. That's socialism. Well, maybe it's capitalism with a smiling face and a soft heart. Well, that's not true capitalism. Purest capitalism, the Adam Smith kind, it just grinds up the common people. And the rich get unbelievably rich. In America, it was known as the golden, the gilded age of the 1880s and 90s. And if you study American history, it stop was put to it by reformers like Woodrow Wilson and the progressive movement that allowed for strikes and unions and things like this. Well, read Upton Sinclair's example. Anyway, that's some of the economic factors behind it. Let's go on to the political factors half an hour. Hang with me. Yeah. I'll have bad breath afterwards, so I don't <laughs> talking as much, okay? Some of the political factors, the rise of nations or nat nationalism. There was a growing spirit of independence among the people, especially in Northern Europe. Let me stop for a minute. What, do you have any idea what are some of the factors behind nations becoming nations? What are some things that happen to have before a group of mixed bag of people become a United Nation? Yes? A difference in goals or religion. Okay, a common religion. That helps a whole lot as opposed to the rest of the world. That's one of the factors that make nations, nations, the polygon. Yes, Ben? Common ruler. Common ruler. Okay. What else? Desire for independence from upon desire. Okay. A common desire, seeing yourself as different from those who are in authority over you. You think of the American experience and the French experience, so there it was a class thing. Here in America, it's a geographic thing. A common language, a common religion, a common enemy. And I think that's kind of what you're getting at. That'll unite people together. These kinds of things. Well, in Northern Europe, the common enemy was the profligate popes of the Vatican. They'd never see the Sistine Chapel in their life. And yet here their taxes were going out almost every day to support that kind of wild lifestyle. And you had peoples now with a common language. In England, the language is becoming common. Two factors behind that, two critical factors, just in passing. One was the writing of the King James Bible in 1611. And now all of a sudden you had a standard English book that everybody read that provided a common... The other was the writings of Shakespeare. That was the other standard writings that everybody knew. And Shakespeare and King James now brought these crazy English Scots and Welshmen and some Irishmen together. Well, the common language, under Henry VIII, the common religion that's different than the going product, the Roman Catholic Church, a common enemy in the Pope when the world, the Catholic world declares war on Henry. All of these were factors that lay behind England becoming a nation, France becoming a nation, and Spain becoming a nation. In England, you had laws beginning to pass. You have Parliament, the strange idea that duly elected members of society can pass the laws. Do you remember the Magna Carta, hearing that. What does it mean? That's Latin. What does it mean in English? Major Charter. 1215. Prince John is forced to sign it. All it says is this. That <coughs> Parliament alone has the right to change the laws. Huge. Huge. Well, that was the beginning of the rise of parliamentary power. And more and more middle class wealthy businessmen become members of Parliament. And so Parliament passed laws that barred appointments to the church office from Rome. That's a critical thing that all throughout the Middle Ages was being fought about. Who has that? Well, the church insisted they had the right to appoint the bishops. But the state insisted they had the right to appoint the mayors or the sheriffs or things like that. There was a conflict between the pope and the kings as to who would claim absolute power. In France, they barred all papal authority. That the Pope has no rule in France. Well, you've got kings that are growing powerful. In fact, he passed a law in France that if any 
emissary from the Pope enters the land carrying a bull, and that's what they called a paper that the Pope says thus and so, to the contrary, that they would be executed, burned at the stake. In Germany, there was no political unity. Germany wouldn't become a nation until 1870. It'd be interesting what brings that about much later. But the German-speaking peoples still resented the, uh, the interference of the papacy and the indulgences that were being sold. You had not only the rise of nations, but also the political theory of absolutism. That might be a good way to identify it. What was the political theory called that said the king has complete and total power? That's what absolutism means. Pardon me? Oh, sorry, I thought you were asking. It's called absolutism. The king rules absolutely. Well, it's based on the Bible. Romans 13.1 says the powers that be are ordained by God and anyone who resists the powers that be is resisting God himself. Well, the king is the obvious power and so there's to be no challenge to his power. <coughs> As nations arose, so also did strong despotic monarchs. And this is called the divine right of kings, that it is God who gives the king absolute power. Well, if you've got a conflict between your king and some pope in Italy, you're going to support your king, generally speaking. In Spain, I would have pictures of these. The absolute monarch is Philip II. Write that down. I'll get into it later. Philip II in Spain, all powerful. But Philip was extremely Catholic. In England, you had Henry VIII. Catholic in theology, but anti-Rome. Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor. These are just a few of these. Being the most important, the most absolute one of absolutism was Louis XIV. Louis XIV. Well, the Louis XII, even before him. Yeah, Louis XIV is the epitome of what it means to be an absolute monarch. Mm -hmm. I'll get it out of politics. I mean, he called, insists he called him the Sun King. And as he got older and older, he, he almost hinted that he should be worshipped. But guess what? He died. Okay. By the way, uh, yes, go ahead. Um, what did you say was about Philip II? Philip II was the king of Spain. So just put Philip II in Spain. Henry VIII was the king of England. We'll say Louis XIV is the king of France. These are, uh, uh, Charles V was a political power figure of the leader of the Holy Roman Empire. He was German, but he was elected the leader of the Holy Roman Empire. Let me finish today's lecture with the religious factors, because I think these are critical. All, all of what I said is, of course, critical. But one of the primary factors that made for the success of the Protestant Reformation was Catholic abuses. Catholic abuses. Let me list seven of them, okay? Number one, gross ignorance of the priests. Gross ignorance of the priests. Ninety percent of them were illiterate. Couldn't read or write their own name. Ninety-five percent could not read Latin. And yet the Mass was all done in Latin. You know, what kind of teaching are you going to provide there? It's just rote memorization. Why is that? What do you mean? Latin? Like, no, I mean, like, why was it that those, the priests were the people who were leading the church, but they couldn't be men? Because becoming a leader in church was simply a matter of paying for the job. <coughs> every, every job was so bad. So. Because it's too much hard work to learn how to read. Why do I need it? All I got to do is memorize a few Latin phrases. Have you ever been to a magic show and the time comes for the change made? What's the magic words? Abracadabra. Abracadabra, if you're from the Orient. What's the other magic words? Hocus. Hocus. Where'd that come from? In the Mass, the critical time of Mass. Now, of course, the common people were relegated to the back rows. They could barely hear as the priest was saying off these rote Latin phrases. 
When you celebrate the Mass, you take the communion. And he quotes from the Latin, this is my body. And when he says those words, that's when, if you believe in transubstantiation as a good Catholic, the bread actually becomes the body of Christ. Well, the Latin word is hoc, H-O-C, est, E-S-T, corpus, C-O-R-P-U-S. This is my body. But to the people in the back rows, it sounds like hocus pocus. When he says hocus pocus, that's when it becomes the body of Christ. So that's the magic word. But who knows? What, and, and like I say, ignorant priest, you're not going to learn anything. They don't see their job. Their job is to sell you forgiveness and shorten your stay in purgatory and make sure you're a good little Catholic and abide by all the rules and turn your head at the corruption. Ignorance of the priest. Number two, clerical immorality. According to the church, if you're going to be a priest, you've got to swear a life of celibacy with a C. What does celibacy mean? Not getting married. Pardon me? What? Oh, uh, not getting married. Not getting married. No sex. Sex is of the flesh. The church is having a problem right now as we speak with this. 300 priests in the state of Pennsylvania alone. A thousand cases are being, but because of sexual frustration. Well, celibacy was a joke in the Middle Ages. Kind of like it's a joke now. Like, yeah, don't get married, but I abuse little children. What is that about? The clerical immorality. There were priests and popes all had mistresses. Pope Innocent VIII was one of the Renaissance popes. Sired eight illegitimate children while he was in the Vatican. Who? Innocent VIII. What was his name? I don't know. That was his papal name. I forget what his real name. Spaniard. Around 1490. Eight of children while he was in office. Well, you put up with that so long. After a while, you say something's got to be done. Third, Simon. Do any of you know what simony means? Simony, it means selling religion for money. Remember, I think it was Paul and Silas who were doing miracles on their first missionary journey in Crete. I think somebody blind could see. And there was a local magician by the name of Simon. And he came and said, hey dudes, what do you charge me if you teach me this trick? And it was Peter who said to them, to hell with you and your money. The idea that you can buy God's power, God's blessing, God's grace is called simony. Well, in the church at this time, everything was for sale. Pope Leo X, one of the Renaissance popes, made more than a million bucks a year by selling offices. A bishop dies, who's going to be the next bishop? It goes to the highest bidder. It was not at all unusual to have little children being bishops because their fathers were wealthy enough to buy the office. They didn't talk about not knowing Latin and being illiterate. They were little children. They were babies. And they are the bishop of such and such province. Well, and so when you became bishop, if it cost you $100,000, you'd turn right around and charge your people for that so that you don't suffer. So if you want to get married, it costs you double now for the first five years. Or if you want Annie to be buried with the last rites, fork it over. You see, with church is the center of life, you fork it over. You can't dream, think of Aunt Sally suffering in hell. Nepotism. Is there another? It's number four. I'll see you in a minute. Yes, it is. What does nepotism mean? Favoring people who are related to you. Right. I mean, that's exactly right. Favoring your relatives. So that placing family members in offer. Alexander IV, another one of these <coughs> Renaissance popes, filled Rome with his Spanish cousins, made them cardinals. They're all related to the pope. Dispensations. Can, can you write that without me writing it down? Dispensations. In other words, if you want to buy your way out of a vow or a marriage or something, 
you could go to the bishop and he'd say, fork over some money and I'll let you leave you no longer bound to that bond. That's number five. Ah, indulgences. Let me explain this one. Could you do right, I think. Basically, what an indulgence was is you could buy your way out of purgatory. Everybody ends up in purgatory, whether you spend 10 years or 10,000 years there, it depends on how good a life you lived. And if you suffered enough, then God would let you escape into heaven. Well, with indulgences, uh, I've got to explain this, how it's worked. It's based on the idea of the treasury of merit. Merit is another word for grace. Basically, if you believe, God lets you into heaven if you're good enough. If you have enough merit. That if, in the scale of your life, the good deeds outweigh the bad deeds, if it does so enough, if you've done so many good things, you might even get to skip purgatory, but almost nobody's that good. Well, you've got saints who were more than good enough to get into heaven. What do you do with all those extra good deeds that they had? The church claimed we have control and there's a treasury or a bank account of merits of the extra deeds of the saints. Maybe on a scale of one to 100, all it takes is 50 and you got saints that are 60, 70, 80%. All that extra grace goes into treasury control by the Pope. And so if he needs another $20 million for a new cathedral, he sends his salesmen throughout Europe. Say, come and buy indulgences. By the way, you've got Christ. How good was he? Man, he's off the chart. you got all that extra merit, and it's for sale. And the salesmen to come to town with their sales pitch. As the coin in the coffer rings, another soul to heaven springs. And I'm making that up. In German, it was Tetzel, T-E-T-Z-E-L. Write it down now, you'll get it again Tuesday. That came, that sort of ticked off Luther so much he couldn't stand it. Just simply, buy, you can't stand it, Aunt Sally tormented there in purgatory, and so if you pen, gather the family and pool the money, Let's do it so that merit can be applied to Aunt Sally's life and she can be released into heaven. Basically, it's grace for sale. You're screwing up your nose, Cana. Well, it, it, it's, it is what it is. It was what it was, okay? Indulgences. So prevalent that the banks had to take over so much money. Yes? Can you explain what purgatory is? Purgatory? purgatory. Good question. <coughs> when you die... We usually believe as Protestants there are two places you go. Either hell, outer darkness, or heaven in the presence of God. But by the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church had come up with the idea with an in-between place, purgatory, where none of us are good enough to make it into heaven by our works, and so we've got to pay the price for our sins. They have to be purged through torment. And so purgatory was that in-between place between heaven and hell where you paid for the sins you committed. And once, however long that takes, then you can be free to go on to heaven. So it's like a waiting room? Yeah, very good. A waiting, they're very good. That's a good analogy. A waiting room. Suffer enough and you get to go to heaven. Or maybe you've got some great nephew who gets rich and decides he'll shorten his stay by buying some indulgences on your behalf. Okay. Seventh, this is the last, the sale of relics. Relics. Relics were holy objects which had healing powers, good luck charm. And there was a bargain basement booming business of the sale of relics. They said there were enough splitters of the original cross to float a navy. There were as many as seven shin bones of the ass that Jesus rode on in Palm Sunday to Jerusalem. Last time I checked, it could only be four, but there were seven. You would buy these relics. 
the, uh, uh, 12 heads of John the Baptist floating around Europe in royal library shelves. Well, these are the abuses, the seven of them, at the cabinet. And they refused to change. They just couldn't read the writing on the wall. That's the way it's always been. What do you mean? Stop the sale of indulgences. I need another, you know, sculpture from Michelangelo or something. But the real issue is theology. Theology. Martin Luther said, others objected to the life. I objected to the theology. There were others that came before Luther that saw all these abuses and spoke against them. <coughs> but for Luther, it was primarily, whoops, a theological thing. There are two strains of theology in the Middle Ages, Catholic theology. One is that of St. Augustine, and the other is that of Thomas Aquinas. I had to read both of them. They both suck. <laughs> they were so hard to read. Hang with me, okay? <laughs> Augustine and his theology began with God. As you're fashioning and forming your own theology, where you begin will determine where you end. Aquinas began with man. Augustine began with God. And so in his theology, he believed that God was sovereign or the sovereignty of God. You may have heard this from your pastors. What does he mean when he talks about the sovereignty of God? Okay, all powerful? The sovereign is the one who's in charge. He's ruler over all the universe. Ruler over all the universe. That's the sovereignty of God. That's Thomas, rather, that's Augustine. That God is sovereign. And basically the reformed movement of the Protestant church. You heard that phrase. Calvinist. They hearken back to Augustine. Abraham Kuyper, who was a, one of the great Dutch theologians, said, what the sovereignty of God means is that there is not a square inch in all of the universe over which God does not say mine. He is in control. Do you think he's right? Is God in control? Then how do you explain the murder of millions of babies before they're even born. Predestination versus free will. That gets to that, right. We're getting, we're getting to that in a minute. In Madison. Is God in control? What What do you say about my sister that spent 40 years as a bipolar schizophrenic? Mm -hmm. Who tried tearfully, oh, well, why would God do this to me? Pardon me? Eventually, but how does that ring with the millions of babies in Africa that are born with AIDS with no hope due to no nothing wrong that they chose to do? Yeah. Well, you're gonna have to settle that issue. Aquinas said, we're talking about God by definition, he is sovereign. You mean Augustine? Pardon me? Augustine. Uh, uh, Augustine. I, I had a professor that would Augustine is the city, Augustine is the man. Okay. And so I use Augustine, but I won't think bad if you insist on saying Augustine. Okay. Well, if that's God, then what is man? And, and Augustine said, man is totally depraved. Seven minutes. Man is depraved. And Aquinas didn't think that not quite totally not totally depraved right okay. total depravity do you think man is basically good or basically evil 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 sola scriptura totally depraved then salvation if it's to happen at all it happens totally and completely by grace You hear a lot about grace, we sing a lot about grace. What does grace mean? Undeserved favor. Okay, undeserved favor or blessing. If I'm saved, it's not because I used to think, man, when I get to heaven, 
I'll be able to brag because at least I was smart enough to see that Christianity was the truth. No, you're not. The Bible describes mankind, un, uh, unregenerate mankind, as being dead in trespasses and sins. What can a dead man choose? What can a dead man believe? What can a dead man follow after? Well, I followed after Christ. I've decided. If you decide it's because God did a quickening, awakening work in you, you have not chosen me, said Jesus, but I have chosen you. Unless in John 6, 44, unless my father, draw, no man comes after me unless my father draws him first. In fact, no one is saved unless God chooses him before the foundation of the world. That's predestinated. Predetermines him before the world began. Ephesians 1, 3. Chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. To be conformed to the image of his son. Adopted into his family. All of it is God's doing. Someone asked a, back in slave day, a little black kid, you know, who claimed he was saved, what's your part and what's God? Well, my part is the sinner. And I sure did that. God's part is the saver. And he did that. Jesus paid it. That's Augustine. On the other hand, he had Aquinas five minutes. And Augustine was around the year 350. Aquinas was around the year 1250. Question, Sarah. Yes. Um, Aquinas, he was the one, now he said partially depraved. Was he the one that said the soul is good, but the flesh is bad? Partly so. Partly so. I, I, let me just begin to say that. Augustine, Aquinas rather, Aquinas was known as the dumb ox. He was over large. He had to squeeze in these little children's chairs in school. And when the teacher asked a question, he was always the last to raise his hand to answer. But it wasn't because he was stupid, because he knew all the ramifications of what they say, this and this and this, and he's working through them. And finally, the teacher gives out, who knows the answer? Oh, no, no, no. Kind of, so I thought he's definitely the most brilliant mind of the Middle Ages produced. Brilliant. Now, don't go run out and read the theology of Aquinas for your book reports because it's 60 volumes long. His summary, Summa Theologica. <laughs> but Aquinas said this, man is free to choose. Man is not dead in sins, he can choose. Yes, we have a natural proclivity towards evil and sin. But the mind is the part of man that is not totally depraved. The mind of man is not totally depraved. That, yes, we're saved by grace, but that grace comes to us through the sacraments. That as we keep the sacraments, God's grace flows into our lives. Well, basically, that's salvation by work. Salvation depends on what I do, how faithful I am to keep the sacraments, and only the church controls who gets the grace through the sacraments. So your salvation is up to the church and up to you to decide whether to follow Jesus. If it's up to me, I'm in deep weeds. <coughs> well, the reformers want to return to all those, from all those abuses I listed and get back to what they call primitive Christianity, the Christianity of the New Testament. You didn't have indulgences. You didn't have sacraments. You didn't have, you know, Simon. Well, you tried, but they put it down immediately. <coughs> and for them, the final authority, Scripture alone, sola scriptura. All of these traditions had come to the Catholic Church over 1,500 years of church councils and meetings and theologians. The Reformers were bold enough to say, we need to get back to Scripture alone. That'll be the key question. In fact, when Martin Luther is dragged into the Diet of Worms to give account of himself, I'm getting way ahead of myself, but I got a minute and a half. The place is packed. You could cut the tension with a knife. In fact, it's so packed they had to pass men over their heads. And he stands before the judge, and the judge has his list of pamphlets and books. And you recognize? Yes. Are they yours? Yes. Do you stand by what you've written here? Can you give me 24 hours? Well, that'll help. So they pass him back out. He goes to his cell. No sleep. And all the doubts and fear. Luther, are you alone right? In 1,500 years of the greatest mind that the church had produced, they were all wrong. 
Next day, pass him in again. He reached the sentence. He said, church councils are made up of human beings. And human beings are prone to error. My hope and faith is on the word of God that never changes. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. And the rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> Father, dismiss us with your blessing. Give us grace this weekend to read, to study, to grow, to serve. May your word come alive for us in our own private study. Lord, as pastors proclaim your truth, more may it penetrate the calluses of our hearts and we come back change people next Tuesday. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a good weekend.